So I found this shelf life project at um, a book fair in, I think it was the fall of 2000. 18. Um, it was produced or it was published by Smings Ming Press and it's a project by Related Tactics who is a collaborative group that does um, really interesting work thinking about representation and knowledge and they use beautiful graphics and visual displays of information to convey information. Um, this little booklet um, is literally the size of like this little zine. I mean it's it's tiny and it came in the original form with stickers that you would use to actually sticker your own shelf. So I went home and I followed the directions and I picked a shelf in my life at my home library and started stickering and that was when I started to really think about what kind of craft knowledge um, was being constructed in particular ways uh, specifically with some of the how-to books and some of the books that People love to say that, that there's no craft discourse and there's no craft history textbooks and it's just not true because the making books are craft history textbooks. These are craft history books. They are not textbooks, sorry. I said textbooks, but I meant books. Um, but there are craft history books and if we understand this as craft history, what does that change about our understanding about how we make craft history? Okay, so there are five questions that sh that the Shelf Life Project asks, and these are related tactics questions. And I find these useful, not, not, it's not about ticking off boxes. What it really is, is about asking questions to understand um, larger systems of power that construct knowledge. And I think that that's something that we're not paying as much attention to in craft. Um, a how-to book constructs knowledge in a particular way, for example, and um, it, it construct no constructs knowledge in terms of how the text is written, who is represented, and also what kinds of images are in there. If the images only show certain kinds of bodies, then the implication is that other bodies are not also potentially doing this work too. And I think that that's something I was really aware of in looking at these books um, in the library here. So when I came in, I decided, um, I thought that I was going to go through all of the books. I was super ambitious. There was no way that that was going to happen. And frankly, I got distracted by the opportunity to make some things. So that pulled me in the evenings to some other projects. Um, but I started with the basket tree books. And um, the reason I started here is honestly, it was right here and I had some questions about the baskets. I wanted to understand which cultures were represented, how they were being represented, and I had some suspicions. And so I started by pulling a couple of, of books. And, and you can see on here that there are, um, right at the beginning, there's a couple of different stickers. And each of these stickers means a different kind of question that I have based on related tactics shelf life. The pink stickers are books that are written by or about a white European man or a, a white man of European heritage. And uh, the yellow sticker has to do with a question about ableism. And this is a big issue in these craft books. There's not a whole lot here that really addresses different kinds of bodies and different ways of doing things. Um, and each of these stickers has a different focus. So if you go to the Shelf Life Project on Related Tactics website, you can see all the questions there. And there are chair sheets for people to take home um, they, the project booklet is out of print, but Related Tactics made uh, cut sheets for us for people to be able to take one home. It's really important to them that they be portable, that you take it, go to the shelf with it, or you chest it out in your own home. So I started with baskets, and on the first day I made it to five books because I'm looking at the content. I'm not just looking at kind of overviews, I was actually reading the books and looking through how is the text constructed, how are the images constructed, who is represented, how are they represented, and so forth. And that was slow. So the second day, I picked some books that I was interested in, Annie Albers Weaving, some other things came up, and I just looked at a few of those kinds of books. And again, I only got through about five or six books. And I read fast, and I'm kind of looking for specific things, but it takes a long time to do this kind of a project. 
So the third day I decided I needed to see some stickers. I needed to see some things. And I wanted to understand kind of parts of this library in a different way. So I went through and I decided to put stickers, the pink stickers on every book that I could identify because I knew who the author was or I could look it up quickly or the text was about, oh, a European white male. And if you will notice, this is, these are the two shelves in ceramics. And look at all that pink. This is just shelf one. This is shelf two. And then this is shelf three. And you can see, now what this tells us is that, and we do have more ceramics books up there that I haven't, I didn't finish. What this tells us is that this particular library is very, very heavily Eurocentric and Eurocentric in that traditional West equals a particular kind of heritage way. And it also indicates that we probably have some space to uh, accept donations about other kinds of books on ceramics that include different parts of the world. One of the things that I noticed both in the basketry and in the ceramics sections is um, in the basketry section, I noticed that there's a huge number of books here that are um, US baskets or things that are, are from the Appalachian region. There's a number that are called Indian or Native American baskets, and there's Japanese and um, Japanese baskets. There is nothing here though from Mary Jackson, who is a MacArthur winning basket maker from Gullah Gullah Island. And so there's a number of big gaps here. Nothing about basketry from other parts of the world. And the same thing with the ceramic section, what I'm noticing is that if you look at just these three shelves, um, very heavy on um, the studio craft movement, very heavy on Minge, on um, British ceramics and on Japanese and Chinese ceramics. There's no African ceramics books here. There's nothing here in this, these three shelves that is focused on ceramics from the Middle East or other parts of the world. So these are the kinds of gaps that I'm noticing and what this is giving me an idea for us for, for thinking about this library down the road is to, to be able to identify what needs to be brought in as we continue and develop kind of a plan for building from there. I also spent a lot of time in here watching what people were reading and it was fascinating how many of the younger participants and talking 20s, 30s are coming in and reading the books. They're not going to the magazines. The magazines are where women and people of the global majority and LGBTQIA uh, uh, artists and craftspeople are represented but the magazines are not of interest. It's the books that everybody was going to. Now, that's what I observed in just these first two weeks. So that tells me that our books are really important as a resource here. Um, the books that people were coming to, to investigate, if we come over here, this, this is where our blacksmithing section is. And this area has the blacksmithing books. And I did talk to um, someone who was, um, closer to my age, a uh, participant in the blacksmithing workshop last round. He was investigating a particular process that came up in class and he wanted more information. So he came up here, read a number of books during the evening and then went back the next day and was able to have a couple of other questions and ideas about how to work on this um, the material because he came up and used these books. Um, I noticed a couple of the weaving students coming up and looking at weavings and thinking about, um, they were doing double weave uh, a technique. And so they were coming up to look at things and we were looking at and drooling and ooing and eyeing over the Sheila Hicks book on her um, small weavings. Um, I know some of the ceramics folks had come up um, to take a look for pictures of figurative work um, to solve different problems that they were thinking about, about how to represent a torso or a face or a head. So everything that I saw in those that short time was really linked to 
people who are making coming up up here to find something that connected to what they're doing with their hands but they're not sitting and reading the texts they're looking for pictures or ideas or coming in and reading specific things to solve a problem so i don't know if that's going to be the case in every session and i kind of wish i could be a fly on the wall and, and understand so i'm hoping that as we go forward other people will um, send notes or talk to me or email me about what they're doing um, and why they're using the library and how they're using it. I've made a little zine and that zine will give people an understanding of what I'm trying to investigate. I just want to know which craft lives on the haystack shelves and is it a craft history that is inclusive and encompasses everything that um, that we're trying to uh, to say craft is in our programming and in the ways people work today. And I'm, you know, clearly with what the ceramics shelf does, um, that's not the case right now. So it gives us a chance to understand where we can work on making this a better toolbox for our um, participants and our makers. So there are two books that really caught my attention um, overall. One, uh, Perry asked me to look at the Annie Albers on weaving book. And um, the first question is to add a blue sticker if queer, indigenous people, people of color, women, trans, or non-binary people are not central to the book as complex or productive characters or community perspectives. Okay, so that is a great way to understand something when it's a very text-based kind of project. Annie Alper's book is a very text-based kind of project and from the very beginning she talks about her influence from Peru dedicated to my great teachers the weavers of ancient Peru and as she goes through this book which was published in 1965 she repeats and explains why Peruvian weaving uh, traditions were important and she does it in a way that is um, very much recognizes learning from another culture in a way that, that caught my attention, it surprised me. She does use the word primitive, and I know some people are sensitive to that, but in the way that she uses the word primitive in a few places, I think it's not necessarily in the pejorative sense that, that I've seen it used like in that MoMA show, there was a famous MoMA show where they, about primitivism. In some of these cases, when she's describing primitive, it's a, it's it's almost a way of saying simple or um, rudimentary in a different sort of way. So there's a little bit of that. I decided for me that I felt that the way she said that word was okay. So the other questions address this this question of whether the book is written about a particular culture or people and presumes a readership not of that that culture. This is written in English, so it's obviously presuming an English reading audience. Um, the way that it is written has certain sensitivities that surprised me compared to some of the other craft books that are on the shelves here. And there is sensitivity to understanding where she's speaking from and that she's, um, she's speaking about people and, and practices in other cultures. Um, in a way that that uh, I think works pretty well considering the time that it was written and considering where we are today in our thinking. Uh, it's not authored by a white man and um, in terms of able-bodied questions this is not a how-to book. It's a book about structures and systems and kinds of things about weavings. So you could take this book and do interpretive dance from it. You could do all kinds of different things. There's nothing in here that really um, is necessarily saying that, that uh, certain bodies can or cannot do this work. It's, it's taking the conversation up to a different kind of place. And I didn't add an orange sticker because she doesn't use he, him, which is, you know, in 1960, a lot of times, he was the default and I didn't see that in here and I may have missed it but I didn't see that and she also doesn't use she she speaks in this really interesting way that actually doesn't gender in this heteronormative way that was really common at that time so 
Annie Albers actually got a gold star. And we have this book on basketry by F.J. Christopher that has 155 illustrations. Uh, this is a Dover publication. Some of you may know Dover from, they have a lot of books where they print patterns from places all over the world. Um, I've purchased these, you can buy them in all kinds of stores. But Dover is the publisher of this one. And it was edited, it was uh, written by F.J. Christopher, but edited by Marjorie O'Shaughnessy. And it's from 1952. Um, this particular book, I actually put every single star, uh, every single sticker on there. Um, there is a way in which uh, indigenous people and um, people of the global majority are written about that it makes it very clear that this is someone who is speaking for, not speaking with, which is a different contrast with Annie Albers, tends more towards speaking with than speaking for. Um, in addition to that, uh, it's obviously written by somebody who is writing about another culture without consulting those the cultures about whom they are writing or for whom they think they're writing about. I, you know, it's it's really problematic. Um, it got a pink sticker because F.J. Christopher is a white man and is basically documenting basketry from around the world um, and speaking for many, many cultures. It got a yellow sticker because there's a way in which it talks about making that um, really does presume able-bodied individuals and um, that you can, you can pull reeds in a certain way and that you're gonna understand what these tools are and you're gonna know how to use them. And then the last one is um, the orange sticker about whether it prioritizes a heterosexual and cisgendered perspectives um, that comes through loud and clear throughout this, that it is definitely written by a, a male. Um, it's not one of those things where I, I think some other people might pick this up and say, okay, but he doesn't say he did this, he did this. It's a tone. It's the way that it's written makes it so clear that he's speaking in a way that is, um, presuming that the readership might be women who might want to make a dainty paper doily or patterned wallpaper. And there's also places in the beginning and the end where he's talking to school te teachers and he's presuming women are the school teachers. But in the center section, there's a whole other attitude with some of the making that's um, described in here. Um, there's wonderful images, fantastic images um, there are definitely citations of, for some of them, but there's a the very similar thing that collapses when people talk about Africa as if Africa is, a, is, is one single unit. Um, there's a way that, that this tends towards talking about indigenous communities as if they're not continuing to make and as if they are one unit as well. It's just really problematic. All stickers, no star. All stickers, no star. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I've also used this in workshops. Uh, we did an anti-racist rethink tank um, at Warren Wilson College, and we used it to examine uh, syllabi and the construction of knowledge there. I think that it, it's, it's a great way to think about what information you're putting out there for your students. So you can use it to take a look at your syllabus. You can use it to take a look at a lecture you're giving. You can also use this to, um, to examine your own syllabi. You could use it to examine your bookshelves. You could use it to examine your research. You could take a look at what research has gone into an object you're making as much as into an article you're writing or a book you're making and think about what you are making in terms of history based on what knowledge you bring into that, that project and in what way. Um, so I hope people will take these home with them and test them out on their own shelves, but I really also hope that people will pick at least one book to test while they're here at Haystack so we can get a sense of how people are wrestling with these questions as a way of understanding which craft history is on the shelves here.